Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Inquisitive Brain Podcast. I'm Shaw, your host. This is a show that brings you interviews and insights from all walks of life on the reality of being. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Just want to quickly remind you to make sure that you follow the podcast, click the like button, subscribe to the channel, and certainly leave us a review on Spotify or Apple. It really does help with the algorithm and so that I can continue to do the interviews. Today, I welcome Sharon Farber to the show. Sharon is a medium. She teaches about mediumship, and she's been a massage therapist and healer for over 35 years. She's also an award-winning artist. Sharon is a mentor, a teacher, and she's written a book, Choosing to be a Medium. She gives readings and demonstrations in person and online, and she also leads an online mediumship circle. Sharon works with all people all over the world on Zoom, and she teaches that if she can do it, so can you. I like to invite other mediums on the show to get their take on what they do and their take on psychicness, mediumship abilities, all of that, because we will all have our own belief systems around that. It's all about beliefs, and we may differ in some ways. So this podcast is about Uh, Take what you like, take the information you like, and leave the rest. We have a great conversation today about mediumship, about some of the misconceptions, and also about how she works. So please welcome Sharon to the show. Sharon, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for inviting me to your podcast. I'm very excited to be here and talk to you. So am I. So I really want to talk to you about your work. You answer questions, but you also teach quite a lot about spirituality, particularly mediumship, because I have found that there's a lot of mystique around it, and people think it's for some, and then it's not for others. I will admit I certainly have not been convinced Yet that everyone can do mediumship, you know, after being a medium for many years, being in circles, teaching at different venues. This is why I like to invite mediums on the show. First questions around mediumship. What made you want to be a medium? And do you think you had a choice? I definitely feel I had a choice. That's really easy to answer because if I didn't put in effort and training, I'm sure I would never have become a medium. So total choice for me, although I'm aware that a lot of people don't seem to have a choice. And what happened was about 15 years ago, somebody randomly invited me to a small mediumship demo gathering at someone's house. And I said, sure, that sounds like fun. No burning desire or need. But yeah, that sounds good. And I went And I think there were about 11 of us and the medium got beautiful connections for all of us. And I heard from a close friend and my firstborn dog. And it was so healing and amazing that I invited her. I had a massage therapy center at the time with one larger room. So I invited her to do small group readings at my healing center. And she did that for about a year, once a month, small groups. And I got to be the host and see more amazing healing and thought, wow. And then I thought, I want to do that. And everybody said, almost everybody, let's say 95% of people said, I didn't think you could learn to be a medium. I thought you had to be born that way. I've heard that hundreds of times since then. And I said, well, I guess we'll find out. And I did. Oh, so the reason I wanted to is because I saw how I've been a massage therapist, energy healer for about 35 years now, and the mediumship just took healing to a whole nother level. Just And another reason is that I gave a massage to a man about 13 years ago or so, 14 years ago, who had chest pain. And it turns out during the massage that his 11-year-old daughter had passed from in a hospital. She was in there for undiagnosed abdominal pain. She passed in the hospital from a ruptured appendicitis. 
And this man, it's a year later, and he still has pain in his heart. And I thought, this man and his wife, they need to see a medium. If they saw a medium, the spirit of the daughter would come through and explain, it's not your fault, there's nothing you could have done, I'm fine, I love you, and they would grieve forever but have some closure and not probably feel the guilt that they might about we should have figured something out. So that was a catalyst of this man needs medium, and this is here in the U.S. about 14 years ago, and there weren't mediums on every corner, and then that was on top of the other experience. It's like, I want to do this. So that's why I wanted to become a medium to help people and because I found it amazing and fascinating and incredibly healing. So you touched upon several uh, issues there. One is the healing aspect of mediumship because I think sometimes all the woo-woo part can supersede the actual healing. You know, people get bogged down with what they perceive to be mediumship and they they forget about, or maybe not forget, but they don't know, perhaps, I don't know, about how healing it is for people, uh, which is why people, I believe, seek it out. Are you believing, though, that it wasn't there, that you you didn't have it, and that you learned to do it? Not exactly. I believe that we all have the capacity. So I believe that we all do, and that it's not about learning something outside of me it's a matter of uh, uncovering an ability in me that I didn't know that I had and that other people can do that so it's not like learning something totally new with energy healing I worked with spirit a bit and some and intuition but um I've never connected with a, a person in spirit so I think it's a combination. So people, that whole thing, do you have to be born a medium? Are you a born medium, a natural medium? And I love one of my videos, a TikTok video is, you know, you can't be an unnatural, you know, unnatural mediums. If you have natural mediums, does that make the rest of us unnatural mediums? I'm like, no, no such thing. So I believe we all are intuitive. We all have some intuition, psychic abilities, and I I haven't met anybody yet who wanted to develop their mediumship and was unable to. Oh. So, and I was the I I teach with the if I can do it, so can you attitude. So I went from no connection with spirit people, no spontaneous abilities, one dream visitation about twenty four years ago, one just a dream thing to learning step-by-step step how to do it, getting my first link, jumping up and down, immersing myself, becoming a professional medium, teaching it. So if I can do it, I think others. That's a really long-winded answer to your question. This is good. Um, some listeners, if you've heard me on some of my uh, podcasts, I have said, well, I'm on the fence, I'm not sure, and I, I don't know. I think you have to have it already, and maybe it's uncovered. So I'm still learning here, and this is why. As it's I beauty. am. Yeah, it's a beauty. I don't know it all. I, we're all going to be developing all the way through our lives. Yeah, absolutely. There's I mean, no way I think that I know it all. No, and I, absolutely, and I'm learning about how it all works and why we are the way we are, and you know, if we are born, you know, we talk about generations. My good friend, Ruthie Phillips, who's a great teacher, she's a clairvoyant medium. She believes, she's a, I think, third generation psychic. So, it, you know, we were talking about that aspect. Does it have something to do with that? And is it genealogy? And and then I had um, Bob Greenberg on, who was on the Netflix show, uh, Surviving Death. And he researches a lot of mediums, and he said that most mediums he met, all of them had some kind of trauma in their early life. So that aspect is interesting as well. So I'm learning about all of this. So when James said, there's this lady, she's got a YouTube series, have a look. And I saw, and I saw you, I said, oh yes, please ask us to be on the show. Because 
I like that aspect. I think a lot of people will gain from that. Okay. You know, there's a lot of ways I believe people say they learn mediumship. So you talked about it a little bit, but what was the root for you? In the UK, mm -hmm. most people, we, we call it sit in circle. Yes. <laughs> Doing the inverted common thing. Um, where they, they go to a spiritualist church and there's a circle and they learn, they sit for weeks, months, years maybe. Uh, so how, how did it happen for you? Okay, well, I believe that sitting in circle is great, but when I wanted to find one, I couldn't find one. I was on a quest for a circle and had to start one. But I'll start at the beginning. I took a three-hour class. I took a weekend class. I read a lot of books. We don't have spiritual churches all over. We have very few of them, and they're the one closest to here. I, well, anyway, there's a particular one I went to once about 10 years ago, and it was good. I revisited it about seven years ago, five years ago, and it was just, it had nothing to do with evidential mediumship. So you can't, but that's besides the point. What I did was I read books, I learned about it, I took a couple classes, and then I got, I tried doing it. I asked, told somebody what I was trying to learn, and she said I could practice on her. And I connected to her dad. I got four pieces of very validated in, uh, information. And one of them was a military uniform that I saw. And not only was he in the military, but the daughter who I was reading for, she had his uniform in her possession and she was looking at it like the day before. And I'm like, oh my God, I can do it. After I learned that I could do it, after the books and that, I just dove in head first. But anyway, I created a circle, even though I was new. And I did 118 practice readings. And then I did practice small groups reading, small group readings for two, three, and four people. And I took it from there. I learned how, and then I did it. Yeah, because I think some people, my experience has been they'll come to me and say, look, I'm getting these visions, but I can't get anything else or something like that. So you explaining that is helpful because it was a process. What you're explaining, it there was a process that you, but also what's important is you, you worked at it. I never tell people it was easy. I put so much time and energy and resources into developing as the best medium I can possibly be. I'm very focused as a massage therapist. I did that really well, built up a massage center. As an artist, uh, as a watercolor artist, I put all my focus on watercolors. Those are some of my watercolor paintings. So I learned how to do that starting at the age of 40. Most people start in school and then with mediumship, it's like, okay, let's sell my massage practice. Let's not have time for painting and just put all my passion into developing as the most accurate medium I can possibly be. And then the teaching part was kind of natural. I naturally teach everything I know. I've taught watercolor lessons and massage and healing. And now my passion is teaching mediumship. As you were saying, when you felt ready, there wasn't anything for you to jump into. There are now hundreds, if not thousands, of teachers, classes, and courses here in the U.S., and there's all the online ones, and I'm giving some of them. And here, some of the people or places you want to go just cost a fortune. But what I try to do is help people here in the U.S. I do classes and retreat treats in person online and try to make mediumship accessible to everybody by offering affordable classes, by telling people who are not already seeing spirit people that, yes, I believe you can do it and I can help you start at the beginning. And mm -hmm. it's all mm -hmm. about providing people with what I wished I'd had when I started. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. You just Sharon Farber Medium on TikTok. So that's been my focus. I really should do more YouTube videos. But the whole point is to 
make it free, accessible, and teach people and let people know that this is something that they can do, that mediumship isn't scary, that it's safe and healing and wonderful. And it's all about bringing love between people on this side and the other. But you, you bring up something else that's important, the scariness of people. Why do you believe people fear uh, psychicness and mediumship, speaking or hearing or connecting to the souls who have passed on? Part of it's probably the culture all over of fear and ghost busting and ghost stories and scary bits like that. Part of it's probably some of the religions that talk about Satan and demons and entities and you shouldn't disturb dead people and a lot of fear mongering. Part of it might be because some, just some of the big name mediums make it seem like they're unique and chosen and to propagate that, that idea that they're so unique they focus on you need protection and that if you don't know how to do it you're going to get tricked by some entity pretending to be somebody so there's it's all fear-mongering i think that's it religion hollywood and maybe some of the mediums who want to be up on a pedestal trying to keep it from being accessible to everyday people by intentionally creating the idea that there's something to worry about and you need protection. I don't buy into any of that, but that's probably, oh, and just people don't know. If people are sensitive to spirit and they see spirit people, maybe they're a child or a teenager and they're seeing spirit and they have no guidance, no support, they might think they're crazy. And, and our cultures have locked people up for hearing voices and some mediums have been institutionalized because no one knew it was mediumship and they thought they were mentally ill. Then there are mentally ill people who people will say, oh, maybe you're just a medium and they might not get the care that they have. And then there are people who have mediumship abilities and they're mentally ill, so it's kind of a nightmare. They don't know what to do. So that's probably why there's so much fear and negative thoughts about it because people aren't informed they don't know what it is how it works and then it's a safe almost science-based mythology yes there's so much research being done at the moment i feel we need more but the skeptics are actually helping in that you know that you know the more skeptical i'm a born skeptic so i still question everything yes and i think that's healthy and helpful but there's money needed for research. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, I think more of the money is being put towards near-death experiences. So much talk about that as opposed to mediumship. However, you bring up another good point about the um, misconception, I, I would say, that we're connecting with demons or that we're <laughs> devil worship or, or that we're somehow doomed because of what we do and we won't make it to heaven whatever perception that will be <laughs> so it's education yes. as as you say is helpful and if you start there so i believe everybody's psychic i've always i've always believed that that everybody's psychic um we all use language like i knew that was going to happen and I believe yep. the language is important, or I told you, because we do know, people, we all know things. Um, and you're helping sort of break down the perception of it being special. Um, I think it's amazing and magnificent and magical and wonderful and healing and all those great things. Ew. But it doesn't make you better. It doesn't make somebody better than anybody else who chooses not to do it or not to develop in that way so what do you think um is probably one of the other biggest misconceptions about I, I will say all of it being psychic being a medium what else do people believe that's just not true they believe that we're crazy or i have people i know who don't know what to think but 
overall, if you don't have a belief in it, then a medium is either crazy or a fake. So that's not nice to feel. And so they think that, or they think we know everything. And that if we do mediumship, we can read their minds and predict the future and all those other things, which some mediums dabble in all of it. I don't particularly. I take all my intuition and psychic abilities and tunnel vision it into evidential mediumship. But they think if you're a medium, you're going to be able to read their mind, know what's going to happen and everything else. What other misconceptions? That we're consorting with demons <laughs> or Satan things like that. There's probably a lot more. And then there's the misconception that if you're a medium, you're going to be able to see their spirit people all the time. I mean, how many people ask you, oh, is anybody with me? And they want you to just at any given time tell you about their spirit people and think that we're, that we know everything. Great point. Uh, yes, that we're walking around just open, just letting everything come in and everything. I mean, if, if we were doing that, then we would be probably crazy um you know because that's that sounds uncomfortable but i did run into a psychologist who still believes that if you hear voices then you're schizophrenic and i did try and explain that there's a difference to the hearing of the voices and and the science world has to understand that science is science for a reason you are continually experimenting and your whole point of science is yes. to investigate, to experiment, and to keep hypothesizing, and to keep discovering. You don't just discover and leave it. You keep working at it. So whatever they're learning, they have to keep exploring. People who know me, trust me, know how honest I am, and still want to have nothing to do with mediumship. When I started and I wanted to give my free practice readings, I thought everyone was going to line up. Me, 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 I want a free mediumship reading. And they weren't. I had to hunt for people to give free readings to 13 years ago. <clears throat> and my thought was like, why doesn't everybody want to have that? And why doesn't everybody want to be one? How cool is it? But um, that's just me. And there are a lot of people who aren't interested. And some people, and a lot of people who still don't even believe it's a thing. We all have our belief system, and maybe they don't believe. And we all, we're all born with free will, I believe. So we have the free will to say yes or no. And who am I to say you're wrong for not choosing it or not believing? We all believe what, what we believe. What are your thoughts about, you know, because you mentioned the, the, the famous mediums. Um, I always found it jarring when I... I've seen them just walk up to people in the street and start giving them a reading. It, and it's a part of my, speaking of belief systems, I've got one now. I find it invasive. I wouldn't, it's not something I would do, but that's me. Yeah, but there, it, it is a TV show, isn't it? So they've got to do something. Right. I think walking up to strangers is invasive, inappropriate, and unethical. It's television. <laughs> not saying that they're not real mediums, doing real mediumship at other times. And, you know, I'm not saying that it's uh, not helpful because I believe a lot of those shows uh, have helped people to maybe open up their perceptions a little bit more and delve in and try. The latest thing, I don't hear it often, but I do get sometimes if I'm teaching, if I'm holding a workshop, people will ask, why do some mediums get names and dates and they can tell you the color that your bed spread at home and all sorts of things. But some mediums don't get any of that. And my answer was that, you know, we're all different. And it depends on the medium. It depends on you. It do I believe it does. It depends on the person. It depends on the energy involved. It depends on a lot of things that's happening. Um, but, but that's my take. What's your take on that? My take is as long as you can give an accurate evidential reading with whatever the way you do it it's fine if you're all about bringing up the emotion and personality and character of the spirit person if you you need evidence so it doesn't have to be a street name i've never gotten a street name and it doesn't have to be 
and X, Y, Z thing, you need that. As long as you can bring the people through, what I do is I invite the spirit person to share with me whatever it is they feel that's important for their embodied loved one to know and how they're going to be recognized. And it's going to be different. And I just want to bring them to life, get as close to them as possible and give information so the sitter can say, yes, I know who that is, maybe get emotional and have a healing visceral reaction to knowing that it's their spirit person. It doesn't have to be, if somebody gave me a license plate, that's not going to help me. I don't know. I don't even remember my own license plate. So as long as you're getting information that the sitter can understand, I think that's great. And we don't all have to emulate anybody in particular. Thank you for saying that. It's, um, you know, some people will, it doesn't happen to me though. I, I, I get it more a question. It's more of a question from people when they're learning. Maybe it's the same for you, you know, if I'm giving a reading, nobody ever says that, but it's more in workshops where they say, can I learn, how do, how do I learn to get names? How do I learn to, to get the dates for people? Um, and they're very focused on that. Well, I hope you guys out there listening to this will will get something from this. I'm sure you will because things are different. So try not to come in with those type of expectations. Keep your heart, your mind, your ears open to the information that the medium is giving. It may not be a name. It may not be a date. But it may be something that connects you with this lovely, gentle, wonderful spirit, loving spirit who wants to come through to give their love and to show their memory. So li listen, open, be open to it all. You asked me what misconceptions people have about mediumship. And the one I didn't mention has to do with this. On the opposite spectrum, there are people who expect that if they go to a medium, they can ask their spirit person anything they want. I just was reading someone who said, you know, I found a medium, it's 280 US dollars for an hour. I'm like, and I want to go because I have somebody and I want to find out what happened to her, how she felt about this, what she felt about me. They had this list of questions and I responded. This was something on the internet. It's like, that's a lot of money and your expectations are way too high. It's not about going and having a conversation and asking questions. It's more of, and there's no guarantee that a medium is going to get a specific person. So I told this person, sounds like if you did that, you would have a high chance of being disappointed. And that mediumship is more about the medium using their intention to connect out of love, hopefully getting information, and maybe you'll know that the person you're hoping to hear from is alive and well, they love you, they're connected, and hopefully some specific evidence so you know it's that person. And maybe there'll be a message, oh, they really did love you, they did, and there might be clearing up a mystery, but that's a bonus. So people have unrealistic expectations and some of them think when they go to a medium and they have a vague idea that mediumship is connecting with loved ones in spirit and then they're there it's like is my man coming back um where's this hidden i need to know about the will and i try not to roll my eyes and it's like it's not like that i had a woman get a reading from india and I'm connecting with her mother, and she just wants to know if her man, when her man's coming back. And I, and I said, this is mediumship. I'm bringing through your mother. Well, ask her. <laughs> I said, it doesn't work that way. So I just wanted to address people's misconceptions on the other side that we're going to be able to interview or interrogate a spirit person and give them all the answers that they want. Sometimes it's clear and accurate. Sometimes it's playing like playing charades. And we do the best we can, but it's not like an interrogation. Yes. Which brings me to uh, ask you about what is, what's the top question or focus that you tend to get uh, from people, area of focus? There's the thing about, does everybody go to the spirit world? Do people pass by suicide still go to the suicide? What if they have an overdose? 
Uh, does everybody go? That's That might be the biggest one. And just to put it out there super quick, everybody goes to the spirit world. People who take their lives go to the spirit world. Quick, unexpected passings, spirit world, unfinished business, people who don't want them to leave, all of those, you still go directly to the spirit world. That's a, a big misconception I find is that people think when people pass to spirit that all of a sudden they become this loving, kind, wonderful person that was is so different from when they were here. My experience has been that not always the same, but the personality is. So if they swore a lot on the old plane, a lot of times they'll come through using the same language or if they smoked, they might still be smoking that. <laughs> I might smell cigarette smoke or whatever it may be. So sometimes the soul evolves. This is my experience. I'll find that they may say, I'm sorry that I did that or treated you this way. But that's not a guarantee. Sometimes they come through and that sorry isn't there. So, so that's involved isn't that's where your healing skills come in where we say as healers it may not be what you want to hear but listen to what they're saying just be open and hear what they're saying mm -hmm. right in this moment and i believe that's where our real skills come in we can bring through the information but we also help to facilitate what they what comes through it might because you can get lost in the translation and that we have to take 100% responsibility for what we say and share. And if it doesn't feel like it's going to be healing and supportive, maybe we're misinterpreting it and maybe, because I don't think any spirit people are intentionally trying to make a sitter uncomfortable, but we're responsible for how we deliver it. So basically, I'm saying I agree with what you say yeah. and that sensitivity and tact and loving support is important. Um, because, you know, people are who, my experience is when they go to spirit, they're pretty much who they are or else I wouldn't be able to give you enough evidence to even recognize the person. Exactly. Know, he was, yeah. what I, the way I explain it is, that on the other side, I believe they don't have the ego, the issues. They may have been abusive and nasty while they are here and that that's gone. They're healing on a soul level. They're aware of the pain they may have caused and all that. But as a spirit presenting through a medium, they need to present themselves the way they were when they were here or people aren't going to recognize them. So if we're talking about somebody who was a, who was nasty and did terrible things, if a medium is uneducated or the sitter doesn't know, they might think, oh, you're connecting with a nasty spirit. And so even a medium who's not trained and doesn't understand how it works might be, oh, I've got a nasty spirit here. They have a loving spirit person coming through to support and connect and they need to express themselves the way they were when they were embodied or they won't be recognized yes i i think that feeds into fear too that people think there's something around their space or in their space and i want to say look i've got news for you there is there will be there always are <laughs> so if you're scared now i i can't help you there because there's stuff around you but don't be afraid this is not out of fear. And I tell people if they have fear issues, I discuss the fear issue more often in the mentorship sessions, in classes, and with people studying mediumship, they're the ones with the fears more often than somebody coming to me with a reading. And I explain that there are no evil spirits, the spirit world is safe. And my limited 13 year experience, but my mentors who've been doing this for decades each, Everybody, they've been doing this for decades and decades, and the whole consensus is the spirit world is safe. This planet, not so much. I have a healthy fear of embodied people. People do terrible things. They can be cruel and horrible and kill and torture and all that kind of stuff. So I have a healthy 
fear of embodied people, but not of those in spirit. I have no fear. And I don't think anyone else should have fear also. The good and evil is here on our earth plane. And in my experience, the spirit world is completely safe. So that's what I tell people. And that it's important for these of the mediums to have good boundaries, to decide when you want to connect with spirit people, when you don't, and not to let spirit people make you feel overpowered with an emotion or a physical feeling and just say, back off, say no. I tell people that they're never obligated to connect with a spirit person. If, you know, the people are like, oh, they're spirit people, just say no, not your deal. Tell them. You go talk to your embodied person and tell them to arrange a reading and then I'll be happy to bring you through. So I think it's all about, for mediums, it's all about empowerment, boundaries, and education. And by the time people come to me for a reading, they're probably not scared. I think there's a lot more potential for damage, anxiety, and fear creating with a psychic reading. And also that... To me, it feels a bit like people are giving their power away. When you go to a psychic, you don't know. And it's like, tell me what to do. Should I stay in this person? Do you know, are they good for me? What should I do? And a good psychic, intuitive guidance, beautiful support, loving, wonderful. But I don't do that. And I would never... want. You, know, you don't predict somebody's going to die. There's going to be an accident. And... That kind of makes me cringe a little bit, that whole concept of telling people things in the future. And even if they're good things, you can't guarantee them. And what if a psychic predicts something really good and then the person counts on that and then it doesn't happen? And there's, I guess, a greater potential for misuse, as I wanted to say. I'd just like to remind you all to click that like button Wherever you're listening, wherever you're watching on YouTube, leave us a comment. It really does help with the algorithm and to push the podcast forward. If you're listening on Apple, Spotify, or any streaming platform, please do the same. Like the video, share it as well, and leave us a five-star review or any review, whatever you're thinking. Feedback is welcome. Thank you for your support. I've heard of somebody who went to a psychic and the psychic told them, a young woman, that she'd never have kids. Can you imagine how that would affect her life if she believes that? I have a friend, a psychic told her her husband was going to get cancer and die. This is a personal experience with a a friend who was in my mediumship group. Her husband did get cancer. This was years ago. As far as I know, he's still fine. But can you imagine the fear and horror of... A psychic gave her a reading before that and was accurate. And then the psychic gives her another reading and tells her that. So anyway, I know I'm going off on a tangent, but I see the potential for harm there. And in mediumship, you're connecting with loved ones in spirit. You're letting people know they're there, they're alive and well. You're bringing through their personality. And if you're not going to try to do any predictions and things, and you're coming from intention and love and healing, I don't see any potential for people even hearing things they don't want to hear. I don't even think, I think it's so wholesome, positive, and safe doing actual mediumship, just connecting with loved ones in spirit. Does that make sense? It does, what your explanation does. But there are mediums who call themselves psychic mediums. In fact, many of them do, and some famous ones do. Um, So I don't know, because I haven't had one on the show yet. I'm not quite sure how that crosses over, so I'm going to have to find one to come on the show, because I think what you said is very important, but I wonder if the information can be, if they can, if you're a psychic medium, then you're perhaps, I don't know, I'll ask them, giving both. You're doing mediumship, but you're also getting psychic. What I I believe psychics give predictions, which mediumship is not. Mediumship is not about predictions. And so I wonder if you're a psychic medium that you're doing both. I'm sorry I'm trying to put 
if it sounds like I'm putting down psychics or being overly negative, I apologize. I and I'm sure that most psychics are doing intuitive guidance, loving, supportive, and wonderful. I just have my own because of some experiences I know about and one I had personally. Just I'm not comfortable with it because because I'm not personally comfortable. I'm not trying to put it down. It's interesting in my book, I had a chapter on, but do I, that I that I tentatively said, but I don't want to be a psychic. And it talked about what I just explained right now. And my editor cut that whole part. She said, you're shooting your audience because most people believe in mediumship and psychics. And I was so... I guess a bit negative about the psychic part, and then they took that whole part out of my book. You bring me to your book, actually, choosing to be a medium. So, what inspired you to uh, to write this book? Um, I two things. One, the, the the on the spiritual level, I was compelled to write it. I had never been interested in writing a book. I'm not somebody who was all about writing. No idea. And and it was early in my development as a medium. And I had these like, well, anyway, I should write this. I should write this. And I'm like, what? What? You got to write this, write this. And then I started and it really came together. So on some level, I feel I was compelled, supported, I don't go around saying my spirit guide said this, my spirit guides. I'm not one of those. I do what my spirit guides. But in this situation, I was very much supported. And I said, okay, well, then I want a lot of help. And I had a lot of help. And I got an agent and a publisher and all that kind of stuff. And I think I had a real lot of help. So there was the spiritual aspect like that. On the other level, all these people, all these years, I didn't think you could learn to be a medium. I thought you had to be born that way. Kind of like in Harry Potter, where you have the muggles, are people who don't have magical parents, and the highborn elite magical people look down on them. And anyway, just a little analogy. I learned to become a medium, and I wrote the book so that it becomes more accessible to people who had no idea that they could learn to be a medium. For people who are a little intuitive, had a few experiences, and they're told that instead mediumship is for the chosen few with their unique abilities. So I wrote the book to help people like me or people who might want to learn. But the other thing is the missing link I find in people thinking that they're not developing is that they're not trying to give readings to people. I have had someone attend an online beginner class and then sign up for a mentorship a couple months later and they're not getting anywhere. It's like, how many practice readings have you given? None. And I was like, well, how can you say you're not developing and you can't do it if you're not trying? So mm -hmm. my little spiel here is that if you don't, that the only way to develop your mediumship is to give practice mediumships, practice mediumship readings to other people, preferably people that you don't know, not your closest friends, not your immediate family. And that if you're not trying to do that with mediumship, you can't just sit in your room and meditate or try to get your spirit guides to teach you everything or any of, or have crystals meditate crystals or sit in circle if you're going to be passively sitting in circle you need to give use your intention to give readings to other people where you can connect with their loved ones in spirit get information you can't possibly know other way and have them say oh my god yes i recognize them yes oh my gosh and actually do it so that's a missing link for, link for a lot of people. They don't try to actually do it. They try to do it on their own. I hear this a lot. I meditate. I'm doing this and nothing's happening. You need to one-on-one. -on -one, you know, if you don't, you can sit in a class, sit in a circle, 
and all that, but you need to try to get reading. And I've seen people who had never had a link, taken my beginner class, got the first link, watch them light up like the way I did, and then have them maybe sit in circle with me for the next couple of years and give brilliant readings and just watch them blossom and be amazing. My website is the best approach, just SharonFarber.net, because at the website, you can read about mediumship, schedule a reading, get a mentorship, read about the circles. I do four online circles every week, and they're usually full, but then there's some turnover. Right now, I happen to have an opening in the Tuesday evening circle and the Thursday afternoon circle. Someone's about to have a baby one person, you know, things shift. So they can find out about everything there. And I have Calendly so people can do online booking and they can message me or email me with questions. Sharon, I love speaking with other mediums. It's just helpful to learn and get different viewpoints. And essentially we're doing, we're all doing the same thing. We're, we're connecting with spirit and helping people connect through us. We're literally the medium facilitating that loving healing experience. So thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for having me and the work that you're doing and getting this opportunity to discuss mediumship and all your beautifully thoughtful questions. Thank you for joining me today. Be sure to like, subscribe, and comment and share the video on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow on your favorite social media platform. See you soon.